Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is November the 22nd, 2021, and this is uh, the regular meeting of the West Shore Photography Club. We have an image review tonight, but before we get to that, let me uh, go over a few announcements. Uh, reminder that there will be no meeting next Monday night. That's November the 29th, and it's the Monday after Thanksgiving. And uh, well, who knows, some of you may be going deer hunting, but in any case, we don't have a regular meeting. Our next regular online meeting will be Monday night, December the 6th. And I have the pleasure of presenting that evening. The topic of my presentation is tips for photographing in harsh light. Uh, and it's based on my trip out west in May, in which I did indeed photograph a lot in harsh light. Uh, we had a great trip to Gerhardt Machinery uh, last Saturday. Uh, at least 20 club members were there and one guest who uh, uh, said that she would be joining the club uh, had a great time. The weather started out a little chilly, but got uh, warmer quickly. And uh, oh, I got to meet the owner, Roger Gerhardt, uh, thanked him for allowing us to photograph there. And he said he would be interested in seeing or, or getting some of our pictures. So I'm going to send an email out to the folks at least the ones I remember who were there. <laughs> uh, but if you were there, and would you email me four or five or six of what you consider to be your, your, your better pictures from the day? Uh, if you would, I appreciate it. I'll make them available to him uh, through my website. And then he's going to pick out a couple and uh, I'll go ahead and print them for him. So with that being said, <laughs> let me turn the uh, meeting over to Joe briefly for comments uh, about a few things, and then we'll get back to the image review. We have a, uh, the trips committee met and we come up with our schedule for the first quarter. And we had one trip and it still may go on uh, for December the 5th down at Boiling <laughs> Springs, which is their luminary festival. They've uh, had to cancel the, the big event but the luminaries will be there for the month of uh, December. So we will uh, let you know when we've rescheduled that. It could be during the week or on a weekend, and it will be in the evening. But other than that, there's nothing else to report from the TRIPS committee. Okay, very good. So we have the pl uh, pleasure of Mike Donovan's company tonight and uh, his review. Uh, there is no theme, as you probably already know. And I want to remind people to put on your calendars when we have a review that Thursday night at midnight is the deadline. Uh, we have nine images tonight, and I, I'm sure you know, uh, we'll, we'll take sufficient, Michael takes sufficient time with those to give him a thorough review. But I want to keep the, uh, the images coming. Everyone has indicated that they really appreciate the image reviews and they find them valuable. Uh, but I think some people are forgetting about the deadline. Uh, we want to you know, make sure that we get enough images to keep it going. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, it's all yours, buddy. Thanks a lot for uh, taking us through this journey again tonight. You're welcome. Can everyone hear me and you can see the screen? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, we're good. Screen. Yes. Okay. Um, a couple of things really quick about image reviews. As you know, being artists yourself, art is totally and completely subjective. Totally. Any, any suggestions that I might have come from my own, I don't know, study and experience. And, and if you try them and you think I, that's not what I wanted to say, then hit undo and pretend I never said it. So if you're nervous about putting something up for a review because everybody else will see your work and then somebody like me will come along and criticize it, <laughs> Don't think of it as criticizing. Think of it as getting more suggestions from more people. Try what you want to try. And if it doesn't work, well, okay, my idea was not correct. Art is totally subjective. And the other thing is I don't have access to your thoughts before you take the picture. And that's an important thing is the thoughts before you take the photograph. So put some images in there and, and break the ice and see what you think. My ideas are different from Chris's. Chris's are different from uh, Chip's and so on. And that's why you have different judges. So you can get different points of view and different ideas. So put some in if you're nervous. Join the club, take a number and get in line. 
put it in and see how it goes. See what happens. Yeah, Mike, if I might uh, add to your comment there, uh, one thing to keep in mind, especially for beginning photographers, if you fall into that category, is the people that are reviewing your images have been doing this for a long time. So I, I would like you to at least consider seriously what they have to say. Yes, you might shrug it off and say, well, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I don't like, but they are saying it for a reason. They've been through this. They, they, they look at many, 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 many images. Uh, Mike's, for example, has been judging for years. So at least seriously consider what they have to say and try to understand the reason behind the comment. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Send something in for the next review. And hi, Al. Hope you're well. Okay, image number one. Oops. Okay. Um, vanitas or vanitas with fruit and musical instrument. I had to do a little homework on this. And here's what I found. I'm going to pronounce it vanitas because it appears to be Italian to me. So that sounds better than vanitas. Um, it's, it's actually a still life that includes symbols and symbolism and especially symbolism concerning uh, mortality and the worthlessness of earthly goods and that kind of thing. It also um, comes from the same root word as vanity and not the piece of furniture vanity, but vanity as in Ecclesiastes, all is vanity. And that's where, that's where that word comes from. And it's important to know that because now, as you look at the still life, you can see the symbols mean different things. Uh, the skull, of course, meaning death or mortality. The um, musical instrument, uh, the arts and the beauty of life. The sand dollar, I'm sorry, the, um, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Anyhow, the, the um, timer, <laughs> let me put it that way, is showing you the brevity of life, uh, the candle, the same thing, how life is moving on and, and burning out. You have the uh, fruit, which usually in many paintings actually represents life. The academics are represented by the books. So it's really a, an entire lifetime in this one still life. Now, my actual review begins by saying congratulations on doing a still life. Because we don't get many of those. So you're to be commended for trying something different. Your color palette is truly appropriate. There's nothing garish, nothing blasting. The teeny weeny little touch of red doesn't really do anything harmful to draw your attention because in this case, your attention is on everything. Your exposure is good. I've got to get rid of these. There we go. Your exposure is good. Um, it looks like window lighting because it's lighter on one side. You can see the grapes have the reflection on the left and not on the right. You can see that it's a little bit brighter on the left than it is on the right. So the window lighting is, is really nice, really, really beautiful. The symbolism is excellent. You made good choices in your still life. Now, what I might suggest, uh, my next note here says, what could they have done better at the time of capture? Well, I'm going to suggest something you could have done before the time of capture. And I know this is gonna sound picky, but the next time you do something beautiful like this, steam the curtains. No wrinkles. You want a smooth, beautiful backdrop that will take nothing away from your, your foreground, which is, is really set up nicely. So make sure, because if you make a print, those little wrinkles don't go away. They just become more obvious. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And also, you could think about if you wanted more light on the right, you can always do that with a dodge, but you could do it with a reflector too and see, see what you think of that. Um, the next question is what could they do in post-processing to improve the image? You know I'm a stickler for those little white dots that draw attention when you print. And um, if you can see my cursor, you'll see I'll just pick a few out. 
And don't let my pickiness keep you from submitting pictures to the next image review. So take a look here. Uh, maybe you want to get rid of that and clean that up a little bit because white draws attention. You can see that in the middle here. White draws attention. So you'll want to uh, clone those out or, or remove them, how, whatever your software does. Um, also, this is not something I would say, oh, you lose a point for or anything, but I would get, take the underscore out of your title because that is something modern and your image is nothing modern. Your image is hearkening back to the 1700s, um, to Dutch still life painting. So it's, it's beautiful in that respect. So my suggestions would be, um, at least in the software, clean up the curtains, clean up the dots. You, you can try lightening the other side if you want, but that's completely up to you. It depends on how you want it to look. And I have one other suggestion which is a compositional suggestion. This, it, it's the, the old still lifes, if you look at them as in, well, I'm gonna suggest a painter, a Dutch painter, are one unit. And by one unit, I mean, there's really not separation as you work your way across. So this became two units. <coughs> if you wanted it two units, okay. I would just make a slight movement with these shells so that you're connecting the books to here and your eye can work entirely across from the lighter side because lighter attracts attention and work your way to the darker side, which adds depth. But I would make a connection here. This set is not connected to this set and it is still life. You know, some, some judges will say, oh, don't overlap anything. But in a still life, it's, it's helpful, it's important because it's to be one unit and one concept. And this concept is actually the fragility and the enjoyment and the beauty of life. So make sure it's, um, try it again and try just a slight movement so that these are connected and see what you think. Uh, technically, the focus is great, um, and it's, it's difficult for me really to pick on focus because I'm looking at it on a pretty big screen, so that tends to soften it a little bit, but this, this looks good. Your lighting is really nice. You chose a, a wonderful f-stop because you have everything in focus, front to back, which makes everything important. Um, I like the fact that you have a piece of cloth that was heavily used in the, um, the old still lifes in the 17 and, and even 1800s. Your palette is subdued. Uh, let's see. You took the concept of life and you used the correct symbols. So, so you, should be you should be proud of that for sure. Now, since it's such a good image, I'm going to get super picky because what I would like you to do, and you might think this is ridiculous, but you took this photograph and you correct me if I'm wrong, you took it probably in your living room and I'm gonna guess you have a grandfather clock in your living room. And the reason I'm going to guess that is because I can see it here. So you'll wanna clone that. And this I think is a tree outside the window. You'll wanna clone that because when you print, it's there forever. And the reason I be picky about this is because this has a chance to be something beautiful. And I might make one other suggestion that I didn't mark. Maybe, depending on your software, if you want to put a little tiny glow on this, give that a try and see what you think. Um, as far as homework for photographer number one goes, I'd like you to look up a Dutch painter. He's a still life painter, mainly worked in the 1600s. His name is Willem Heda, H-E-D-A, not William, Willem, W-I-L-L-E-M-E-M, Heda, H-E-D-A. You will find beautiful still life. You'll find the kind of light that you're working on. 
you'll see what I mean about overlapping. So give him a look and see what you think. Other than that, um, I, it sounds like I have a lot of suggestions, but I, I love the picture and I love what you're doing and the way you're going. I think I know whose it is because of what was submitted last time, but I'm anxious to find out. So who is the photographer? Hi, everyone. This is Dave Marchetto. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I really appreciate what you're doing here. I wish uh, about the meaning before I into this, but um, you know, I, I I do really appreciate your comments. It's uh, you know, it's it's very helpful. Uh, yeah, you know, this is uh, sort of like a um, representative of the the, the Dutch uh, golden age of these sorts yep. of still lives. Some of these are pretty morbid um, with the you know bird skulls and the rest of it, but. This way maybe is a little bit more in the middle. It's not exactly fine art, but like you say, there's there's a lot of symbolism here. Can I ask you a couple of questions, Mike? Yeah, of course. What, um, <laughs> this needs help. I'm gonna take this um, at night and um, I'm gonna light it by candle. I like the light coming from the from the window as you point, but um, not enough. So um, do you have any suggestions for not blowing out the flame and maybe, um, you know, what ISO to use? This is an ISO of 50. So I, I think that's, you know, it's real low. I can pump that up. So, you know, what about, um, you know, the flame blowout and sort of the ISO? Do you have um, a noise reducing software? Uh, it just, it's Lightroom. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you're going to really get into it, you might want to think about a noise reduction software. It's not all that expensive. So you can go pretty high in your ISO and then run it through the noise re reduction software and it'll, it'll smooth it out for you. You'll lose a tiny bit of detail, but you could go that route. Or if your flame is not jumping around because there's a breeze or anything, try HDR. Try an exposure uh, three stops under, and then as exposure, what you think is right on, and then an exposure three stops over. And I'm not sure if Lightroom can combine those or not. I don't really know. Um, I don't use Lightroom a lot, but that would be something else to, to try is HDR high dynamic range. And that, that I think would, would do you probably the best. So you'll yes. need to be on Mike, a tripod. Yeah. Go ahead. Mike, I, I, um, I used a, you know, a very small um, <clears throat> aperture. The, uh, the smallest is an F22. Would you avoid F22 because of diffraction or not? Um, if, well, try a shot. And if you can see yeah. the diffraction, back off. Yeah. Which, you which, might like what the would it diffraction. Look, what would it look like with diffraction? I'm not quite sure what it even, you know, do. Uh, what it does is the aperture is so small that it bends the light pretty hard and it causes some distortion. So that's why a lot of times people are recommended to photograph at F11 and don't ever change. But yeah, that, yeah. Way, that way you don't you can't change your depth of field then either. So digital is free. Put the card in and try all kinds of things. The, the answer, I think, to your original question would be to try um, yeah. HDR, which is three different exposures laid on top of each other, or try the higher ISO and some noise reduction. But you're right. The candle will give you a problem. Um, maybe one more question. I don't want to take up <laughs> all the time here. Uh, but Mike, uh, other than my ironing skills, which... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go into, but uh, um, I, 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 um, I, I would say my last question is from a perspective. Would you like to see this higher, sort of where it is, uh, lower? Would, it, would that matter to you? Um, no, actually, I like it where it is because you can see into the horn of the clarinet. Um, everything is showing up above. Usually when you photograph from above or many times in a still life, it makes it less monumental. If you photograph from below, 
then it looks huge and it may keystone for you. So no, this is fine because it's not necessarily eye level, it's table level. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I wanna thank Dennis for um, putting out there that you should, um, you know, not uh, take this stuff personally and, you know, take a risk because I, I, I really need work on this. And um, your comments are, and, you know, review Mike as usual are extremely uh, helpful to me. And I, I thank oh, you very good. much. Good, uh, you're very welcome. And yeah, Mike, for those who uh, might be wondering, yes, you can uh, do an HDR composite in Lightroom. Very, very simple. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Good. Mike and David, uh, looking at this, I am thinking, what would it look like with some moody light rather than just the window light coming in from the left? Do you have any thoughts or ideas on that, or is that totally away from what the Dutch painters used to do? Yeah, no. I think you're. Yeah, I think you're. You're absolutely right on. That's why I want to photograph it at night, and I have done that actually. Um, I didn't want to submit that, but it it really does get moody. I, I used the candlelight and I supplemented it with continuous light so I could kind of, uh, you know, work it. But the uh, the curtain uh, gives a really nice cast uh, at night um, with uh, you know the the. Um, you know, the light not coming from the day. So I really appreciate that comment. That's, that's what I'm all after, yeah. What, one more suggestion you might try is painting with light, which is- That sounds you're, good. You're in a totally dark room. You have a, a light in your hand. You open the shutter for however long you need, 30 seconds, whatever it takes. And then actually you're painting your still life with the light, the flashlight, or whatever you use. So give that a try. It's it's hard at first to light everything you want to light because you can't tell <laughs> until the yeah. image is done. But give that a shot. I think that would look good. I really appreciate that comment, and uh, you know, Dick, thanks again for the for the moody aspect of it. This uh, this uh, really lacks that, and um, so uh, you know, I, I appreciate that uh, that take on it. Okay. okay, question for you, Dave. Yeah. Did you have to do anything special to get the flame to show? No, not at all, Dennis. And actually, that was my problem because of the, the long exposure. Um, I tried blowing out the candle and so forth, but, uh, you know, my, my exposure was just too long. So no, the, the flame wasn't really a problem. It's just blown out here. And that bothers me. Oh, I, I like the, the the flame. That's I, I was interested in, uh, you know, making sure that it showed. Do you remember what your shutter speed was? Yeah, uh, ISO's uh, 50 and the shutter speed here was probably one and a half seconds, give or take. So it's pretty long. Okay, because you said the aperture was F22? At F22, F20, F22. Yeah, yeah. so the long shutter speed is, is what allows that flame to show. And yeah. I personally really like that effect. Yeah, I, I certainly don't want to lose it. Thank you for that. Um, okay, Mike. Mike, yeah. I have a question for you, if I can. On the, yeah. You mentioned about putting on a glow. Uh, okay. Can you maybe expand on that a little bit, how, how you would do it and why you would do it? Um, the, the software that I use has a variety of glows. Um, what a glow actually is kind of like that Orton effect that you talked about before that you showed. Okay. It, it, puts the tiniest bit of softness, but does not ruin any detail. So it, it looks as though light is almost emanating from inside each thing. Now, Dave, if you put a glow on this and it ruins your candle, you can just, um, I think Lightroom now has masking and you can just mask out the flame so that that's normal. But yeah, oh, that's a, really cool. yeah. a glow will kind of, soften and like illuminate at the same time. Okay. I think that effect will actually enhance the candle. The yeah, flame. very well could. Okay. And, and you know, the last thing I might mention uh, is, you know, I, I took the white balance way down. That resin skull is really almost a sort of a creamy um, butter, almost yellow. So I, I think I washed it out by, uh, you know, especially in the, the hourglass, but with a really, you know, sort of like, you know, low white balance. I, I, I really tried to get that sort of, 
not spooky, but ethereal view. And yeah. I think it went went too far. No, when you look at the, the Dutch paintings, the still lifes, they're all kind of dark and um, they lean toward a warmer, warmer tone. So you're fine there, I think. It, Okay, Dave, I, really I have to comment that. about the uh, the cloth. In the picture, last uh, image review, you used a white cloth, and now you switched colors. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the white cloth wasn't ready for prime time, Dennis. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> Oops. Thanks again, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, peaceful repose. Um, the exposure on here is awesome. It's absolutely awesome. Nothing is blown out as far as the, the actual portrait. Um, there's really no blocking up of the blacks or anything. It's, it's really a beautiful exposure. N nice, sharp focus. And many times the idea is, oh, if you don't see the eyes of the animal, you don't, they don't see him alive. Well, this is proof that that's not always true. The eyes here are compositionally matching the curve of the, the mane and the face and, and point down to the end of the nose. It's really, really nice as far as that goes. Um, it's a beautiful portrait. The, the, um, what could the photographer have done better at the time of capture? Uh, the only suggestion I might have made is for you to either throw a hamburger out or <laughs> jump out and drag this lion out of the way. <laughs> Probably the hamburger idea would be better. So that is something that you can't pass up the shot. And if that's not bothersome, you just let it there. Now, I'd like, I'd like at least to see it with an effort to remove it to see if it makes a big difference or not. And you can do that a couple ways. You can do a selection and then darken what's in your selection. Just use a selection that, you know, the marching ants to outline here and then darken this more. Because what happens is um, there's such a thing as value and value to put it in easy terms means if it's in black and white and it's the same shade of gray, that means it's equal value. But that also is true for color. So if you look uh, right in here and right in here, that's close to being the same value. And what happens is your eye wants to go to the lighter value, which this is lighter than this. So, so this to me is, is something that I would try to get rid of, but it's compositionally it's also very nice because it helps frame the lion's head and mane. So that's, that's completely your business. One other thing you can do is do a selection, cut it out, fill it in with black. You could burn the bottom right, or you could even darken it and put a blur on it. And maybe that would make it disappear. All these suggestions are going on the idea that you might want to make that disappear. If you don't, then just ignore everything I said. The wow factor is awesome. Really, really awesome. Um, technically, it's, it's wonderful. The main shows, the, the hairs show, the whiskers show. It's, it's really great technically. Um, this also has a beautiful curve, which curves right around and continues and continues and continues. It's just fabulous. That's called the golden ratio or the golden mean. And it is a classic compositional tool. It's, it's happened here, whether you knew it or not. It's a, just an absolute great spiral, golden spiral. It has a lot of names and it ends up right here. So that, that is a great composition. The lower right is really the only distraction. This is dark enough that it's probably not bothersome. Although if it doesn't uh, improve your photograph, get rid of it. The lighting is beautiful. The colors are 
soft and gentle, which goes right along with your title. Um, great shot. The processing is excellent. Uh, I'm anxious to hear what you, what you think and what you did. And who is the photographer? Hi, Mike, it's Elaine Shook. Um, <laughs> this, this was an interesting um, photograph that I took in Africa a couple of years ago. And it started out as a very wide angle shot of the entire family of lions, um, which included five cubs and the, his little lady there in the right bottom <laughs> corner. Um, <laughs> so I have about 10 different crops. Um, I, I like them all, um, but I have another crop that I attempted um, as a portrait, which is tighter yet, and it does exclude Include the female lion on the right. And I, I wasn't sure which one I liked better, quite honestly. Um, if okay. I tried to crop her out or black her out, which was easy enough to do, it made his head look like it was just floating in air. <laughs> okay. So I, I left her in thinking that it at least balances it a little bit mm -hmm. um, and provides some sense that he really is on the ground there and not just Okay, working. yeah. But the other reason that I wanted to leave it in, and again, I, I, I struggled. I, I went back and forth with this for the reasons that you pointed out. Um, but the look that he has on his face was one of such a loving and loyal lion. He was yeah. holding his head over his wife, if you will. And just looking at her with so much love and emotion that I thought that might kind of help tell the story. Okay. Um, I'm not sure it does or not. Could um, you do a crop with more of her in it? Possibly. Um, and this is where I get a little, <laughs> I get a little funny. I'm one extreme or the other. I'm either a very close up portrait shot or I'm a very wide angle shot and nothing kind of in between. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm learning to balance that a little bit. I'll I'll give that a try and crop less of it out, keep more of her in, and see if that helps. If um, if there's an kind of... object for him to be looking at, that may help, and then we'll get the story, as opposed to just right. her ears. Right. It does okay. kind of take away from the intensity of his face and the detail in his face when I yeah. do that. Yeah, well, you're the artist. You you try it and see what you think, and if not, then you're good to go. I mean, there's the portrait is fantastic. I think if I um, crop it a little looser, I will also crop out less of the the left side. There is actually the ear of one of the cubs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I do have one that includes um, the entire head of the cub as well as more of the, um, the female lion. I'll yeah. play with that a little more and, and see if that works. Well, technically it's just fabulous for sure. It's, it's, it's a beautiful portrait. Thank you. Hey, Elaine, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. it, the, the lighting is beautiful. Would you describe the uh, time of day and the ambient light conditions? Uh, yes, it was... Uh, Actually, this was late morning. It was the sun was very high um, in the sky, so it was harsh light. Um, I shot fast to uh, mitigate that a little bit, um, and that was really not an issue. And I did have to do quite a bit of reduce the highlights quite a bit in post to eliminate that. Um, and I actually did some softening of the face. Um, he looked quite harsh. Yes. And um, so I reduced clarity to soften it up a little bit. Okay, Are thanks. I'm, I'm surprised. I, I would not have guessed that it would have been taken in harsh light. Maybe maybe even like a, um, a small vignette that it'll take some of her being in the corner out, but she'll still be there. Mm -hmm. So that, just some ideas to try. Okay, I will try that. Do you know a photographer named Peter Delaney? No, I do not. Okay, but well, maybe you want to check him out. He does this kind of work as well. 
Peter Delaney, D-E-L-A-N-E-Y. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, you're welcome. I have a question for you, Elaine. Um, when we photograph together, you've often mentioned to me that you will purposely underexpose your images just a tad. Do mm -hmm. you do that on your animals? Like, would you have done that here? Probably, yes. Okay. And mainly because it was so bright and the light was so harsh that day. Um, I didn't, <laughs> didn't do a lot of intentional photography, though. I'll, I will tell you, when I was in Africa, there just wasn't time to think about it. <laughs> Um, so some of it was haphazard, but I usually leave my um, um, TV comp set to like point minus seven, okay. minus point seven. Okay. Okay. Thank did you. you use, did you use to take film? I did. But that I would didn't. explain the underexposure all the time. <laughs> Oops. I prefer to um, underexpose because I find yeah. that it's easier to correct underexposed photos than it is to correct blown out highlights. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, that'll be one of my tips on December the 6th. <laughs> well, you're too late. <laughs> right. Stole that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Number three is fallen leaf. Uh, as far as the wow factor goes, the punch of orange and blue is always wonderful. Uh, it's what makes the sunset look so great. The complementary colors, one cool, one warm, um, different wavelengths, not to get into the science, but it makes, each color makes the other pop when they're complementary colors. And you can see this leaf almost jumps off the screen. Um, technically, the exposure is really good. You're showing the texture in the leaves, in the leaf, um, one suggestion is, and maybe it's only because it's on the screen, is the leaf looks soft to me as far as focus goes. So be careful about that. Um, you can sharpen it up some with a local, local brush, a local sharpener, but you can easily overdo that. So it's best to, um, and if your camera doesn't have a focus block that moves, like on some of them, mine has a little tiny joystick on the back and I can move the focus point around. Then do your focus, use your focus, push your shutter feet, sorry, push your shutter halfway down when you focus on the leaf and then keeping your finger halfway down, do your composition and then fire the shot. Some people like the back button, then you would simply focus on the leaf and you wouldn't have to hold any buttons or anything. So. Um, the leaf is the star of the show here, so you'll want, you'll want it sharp. Uh, another suggestion I might make is your leaf is almost dead center as far as um, horizontal goes. Maybe you want to move it up a little bit or down a little bit. Try a couple of different crops and see what you think of that. But I do like that you didn't dead center it like a target because that the eye then tends to sit there and not go anywhere or do anything. And you have a lot of information in the reflection that you want people to study as well. As far as any distractions go, you know I'm always after everyone to clean up, get rid of white spots. You have no idea they're there until some jerk like me comes along and says, hey, get rid of those white spots. When you print, and I always try to look at something as if you're going to print it, they're going to show up. So clone those out. It takes time. It's tedious, but it does pay off. Now, as far as your lighting goes, it's really quite good. It's really quite good. And you can tell because it's picking up all these textures and lines. So you did the right thing as far as the light goes. You use the complementary colors. That's excellent. The subject matter itself is not so unusual, but you've done it in an unusual way with the reflection and the complementary colors and the textures. So that's good work there. So clean up the spots. Um, keep an eye on getting nice and sharp for your, um, your center of interest there. You have depth with your colors, your composition. Okay, I think that's about my only notes for that one. And before I ask who the photographer is, 
I suggest the photographer and maybe everybody look up Jess Lee, J-E-S-S-L-E-E -E, for some autumn photography. So that'll help you with some of your fall colors and some of your compositions and so on. Jess Lee. Okay, who's the photographer? Thank you, Mike. It's Anthony Tamalonis. Hi, Anthony. Hi. Um, yeah, I shot this the other day at Yellow Breaches, and I happened to be in the shade, and the and the, there was just really nice light on it, and, and the mm -hmm. water was actually a better blue than this. I'm, <laughs> I worked very hard to get the blue to be this good, but in my mind, what I saw was far superior. Understood. Um, and, um, and then just actually just yesterday, the day before yesterday, I, st I started seeing something about this new feature in Lightroom, which I use about masking things out and, and using color. And that's, I've gotten a better blue than this. So I'm looking forward to working with it. Oh, good. And uh, thank you for the finding more white dots. I've gotten rid of, I don't know how many dozens of them because <laughs> aside from this leaf being in the water, there's all these other little bits of junk in the water I that know. I gotta get rid of. I know, the word is tedious, Anthony, <laughs> tedious. Yeah, and, and I really did wanna move the leaf actually down. Okay, but, give it a shot. What, what, no, but what's down there in the reflection is not good, and what's up in the reflection is not good. Fair enough. So it was staying here, and this is where it was, and I like it here now. Okay, then you then that's where it stays. Yeah, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Anthony, back in the day when we worked in the dark room, all those white spots had to be taken out with dye and a paintbrush. Oh god. A teeny tiny little paintbrush and you had to be sure to not match the color because it dried darker. <laughs> oh yeah, it was a nightmare. So this is way better, believe me. Again, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, reflecting by the pond. Um, oh, yeah, Anthony, did I suggest a artist for you? Jess Lee. Yeah, Jess Lee, okay. Uh, reflection four, reflecting by the pond. I like the title because usually it's reflections of the pond, but this is a different kind of reflecting. So that's, um, that's good thinking there. It's a good composition. It looks like the model is walking toward the pond while she's thinking. Uh, there's just a real slight movement in the dress. It's, it's shifted backward a tiny bit, which gives her an impetus moving forward. Um, the, again, the complementary colors of the red and green make the dress really, really pop. So it's a good use of color. I like the fact that it's not the normal aspect ratio. You used a more cinematic uh, ratio, which looks really good. Uh, also, the earring is tremendous. And you're all probably familiar with the girl with the pearl earring, the painting. And you know that in that painting, it catches light and it just pulls your attention. The earring in the hands really are quite a good addition to the, um, to the composition for sure. Now my next note is what could have been done better at the time of capture? I would like a sharper focus. Now it might be again because it's on the screen, I understand that. But if you're doing something like this and you want it dreamy, make it really dreamy. If you want it to be an actual true photograph, then make it sharp because you've got lots of texture in the skirt. You've got lots of texture in the tree. So my suggestion is to be careful on that focus for sure. Now, um, what could you do to improve the image? Uh, I made one mention already. Now, so this, and I know there's people that aren't going to agree with me on this one, but for me, I have like 10 million textures and billions of uh, presets and all that kind of thing. To me, this kind of cries out for a texture to make it look vintage and old and antique. So think about giving that a try, making it look more like an antique thing. If you don't like it, 
don't do it. I would suggest you maybe darken it a bit because the reflecting, you want it more, um, your story is more about calmness and thinking and uh, maybe reminiscing. And the, the high key goes against that kind of feeling. It kind of fights that feeling. So maybe you want to darken this I know if you did black and white, you'd lose all this. So I, I'm not going to suggest that, but maybe like a texture to make it look more vintage or older. Uh, let's see. Wow factor, good. Um, I already mentioned the focus. Oh, the composition, as I said, is, is really quite nice. I love how she's framed here. I really do like that. I'm gonna suggest you get out your clone tool and get rid of this. That would be holding up a telephone pole, which is right here. Without this, you'd never know it was a telephone pole. So I would clone that out for sure. Um, again, the composition is good. I like how she's moving into the image. And these, all these uh, horizontal lines add to the peaceful calmness of it. So your composition really is quite good. It's a creative shot. We don't get a lot of uh, model shots, especially outdoor ones. So that's nice. I like that. So my suggestions for processing is tone it down a bit. The brightness fights with the atmosphere that I think you're trying to create. You correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think that's about all that I have to say for that one. And who's the photographer? Somebody who's muted or they're not here. <laughs> yeah, maybe Rick could uh, tell us who the photographer is. This was done by Diane Parisi. Oh, okay. Let me see. I, doesn't look like Diane's with us tonight. Okay. Diane, if you're going to listen to the... Um... What? <laughs> Diane, if you're going to listen to the recording... I want you to look at a Welsh painter named Richard Wilson. He does a lot with people in landscapes and it'll give you some ideas there. All right, catch of the day. Um, the, what the photographer did well was to capture a moment in nature for sure. You got the catch light in the eye, which is awesome because this thing is moving and moving. Your exposure really is quite good. Um, you've got detail. You've got even detail in the bass and a little bit of um, lighting coming from, looks like maybe lower left possibly. Um, I don't see anything really at the point of capture that you could have done better. Just to get this thing sharp and to get it at a decent background and um, you know, because ospreys can move, they can really, they can really fly. And a little tidbit about ospreys is they always carry their fish head first because it's more aerodynamic, always. And you can see the poor bass, he's getting full of air, <laughs> full of air and struggling. So this is, this is nature at its most uh, basic for sure. Um, one suggestion I might have, it says, what can they do in post-processing to improve the image? Um, you're a bit over sharpened. If you look carefully, you can see a little white halo. And that is generally a giveaway for over sharpening. Now, if you're concerned that the bird is not sharp enough, do a local sharpen, which means take a brush, set it for sharpening and then paint it in so that you're not right on the very edge. You can work close to the edge and that way you'll avoid that halo because that halo says, I sharpened this. So, um, so my suggestion there would be, if you wanna sharpen it, then do it with a local brush. It'll take longer, but then you also, if you do it that way, Instead of a global sharpen, maybe you'll get a little bit more blur out of this too. And you'll also lose some of the, um, some of the noise in the sky if you do it that way. Your exposure's good. 
You can see what I mean about depth, that dark recedes, light advances. You have a really good sense of depth there, very good. And you also compositionally, um, which you don't have time to think about in a shot like this, is you did well with triangulation. So you have a triangle here, you have a, a rough one, but it's a triangle there, and the bird itself is triangulated. So you did a good job there as far as composition. You gave the bird some room to fly into, which is also very good. So my suggestion there is uh, don't worry about the, the blur in the background, sharpen locally, and then you'll avoid that halo. Everything else looks great. Okay, who's the photographer? Uh, thanks, Mike. Kurt Wilkie. Did you, did you hear me? Yes, I did. I'm waiting for your detailed explanation and telling me what a great review <laughs> I gave. You did a wonderful job. <laughs> um, well, um, not much you can say about um, birds in flight other than that. You get, try and get your exposure and your focus, get locked on. Exactly. And you got to pan with them and, uh, and hope for the best when you get home. And that's what I did. Yeah, well, it looks, looks really awesome for sure. Yeah. Shutter speed on this was 2000 at 6.3, my f-stop, and then an ISO of 400. Wow. And uh, I shot this at uh, 370 millimeter. Oh, nice. Well, your f-stop was perfect. I mean, the background is just absolutely the perfect backdrop for sure. Good. Thank you. So nice. Um, there's a photographer named Scott Deere, D-E-R-E who does a lot with birds in flight, maybe you wanna look him up and see, especially uh, when you get to his website, he has a section called Wings at Work. So maybe you'll wanna look at that, Scott Deere, D-E-R-E. Great, thank you. Oh, right, you're welcome. Yeah, maybe I could ask Kurt a question. Sure. Do you process in Lightroom? Yes, I do. And this was, this was done in, in August, end of August. Okay. And I can't go ahead. And I was thinking about that uh, in Lightroom now subject uh, selection and that kind of stuff. Whereas I, I did a global sharpening and I guess that's where um, I'm getting that fringing. Okay. Right. Do um, you where, use the, the masking slider in that section when you sharpen? Uh, yeah, you, you mean, um, sure. And then, and then I'll, I'll mask it. This may have been up near 75 or 80% so that I don't, uh, sharpen the noise in the sky and the uh, and the green the uh, leaves. Okay, that's what I was curious about. I can't see it all the well though my my cheapo screen. But Mike mentioned uh, noise in the sky, and I, I thought, well, if you weren't using that masking slider, that would help in that regard. But you are, so okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, very good. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, hard waves. Uh, as far as the. Let me check my notes here. The exposure is, you did well, it's a difficult situation. Those slot canyons create all kinds of bouncing light and shadows and this and that and the other thing. I, I like that you took a different look in shooting and I'm gonna guess you shot upwards rather than um, the sun shining in and the guide throwing a handful of dust up and you getting all the shots and everything, you went for something different. And that's, that's good. That, that makes your slot Canyon shot different from anyone else's. So that was, that was a good move there to do for sure. Uh, as far as post-processing, the top is a bit on the harsh side for me, but it could be because of the screen. If you want to depending on your software, you can pull out like the yellows and just the slightest drop down because it's, it's drawing a lot of attention, for me at least, away from the rest. Now I do like compositionally how these lines lead to there. So this doesn't have to be super bright because the entire composition wants to go there. 
and it wants your eye to go there. Even these lines, I mean, I know they're opposite direction of what they, how they were really formed, but if you can back off really slightly on the yellow and see if that helps your overall look, rather than having a dark side and a light side, maybe it'll unify your image a little more. It's completely up to you. Maybe you were going for this negative shape here. And if so, then I want to hear about it. I also like that there's, you really have even here, a slight bit of information in here, in here. So your exposure is absolutely on the button. Absolutely. And the fact that it's all warm colors, of course, says the American West for sure. I like the angle you used. Uh, my only suggestion is just try to back off on the yellow a tiny bit see if it makes a difference but it's it's a beautiful image it's a great image your composition is great you may have been the only person looking up instead of out so good work there nice and sharp too by the way the textures all show G good work who's the photographer hi it's uh, zach bergman um, really nice zach thank you yeah so this is actually Antelope Canyon X, the lesser known of the uh, Antelope Canyons, um, also the more affordable one, more importantly, the only <laughs> one that actually had tours available. Um, but uh, yeah, so this was, uh, I think, you know, I, so all the canyons are so different out there um, mm -hmm. in terms of their shapes. And there was definitely a lot of uh, more space up and more interesting things up than, than kind of at eye level. I, I do like the other eye level pictures I took because they give it some context to how big it is, but this uh, kind of captured my eye. more of actually I was looking going for something as a, a wallpaper for my, my desktop. So uh, kind of processed it to, to that extent. When you say taking down the yellow, you mean like the, well, I guess you don't use Lightroom, but the HSL slider, the just taking the color tones, the, the luminosity down on the yellows? In, yeah, just just the tiniest bit. On my screen, it's blown out in through here. Now it Yeah, and, and I actually, I, I checked the original raw file and I I don't have any blinkies, so. Oh, okay, all right, uh, then it's I, I couldn't go back. I think actually when I did process this in Photoshop, uh, it ended up taking it slightly over uh, overexposed on the top. So I might be able to go back and, and redo it and take it down a little bit. Well, like I said, it could also be just my screen too. So you know, if, if you're not blinking and you're happy, then you're good to go. Yeah, and this was actually you know handheld because you can't take tripods unless you do the photo yeah. tour. So it's 1 50th of a second, which wow, I was shocked that I actually got as many <laughs> sharp pictures as I did. Well, it looks great. I lo the tone, the texture, the composition looks fine. Uh, thanks. Sure. I don't have any suggestions to you because I couldn't find anybody that specialized in slot canyon photography. I could find lots of people who specialized in slot canyon photography tours, but not the actual people who that was their specialty. So my only suggestion for you is to Google Slot Canyon Photography and you'll find a ton of it. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, I, I remember this scene actually from Lidditz and it's called Befuddled. Now the guy in the, on the bike looks to me like a Pennsylvania Dutchman. So you could have named this for Hoodled if you wanted to. Um, it's a really, really nice tones. The black and white is, is beautiful. I said it before and I'll probably say it again. If you go from dark to light and as many shades and values in between as you can, it, it's going to look good. You have beautiful layers. You see, and I think you can maybe see my cursor. You have a layer and a layer and a layer and up here, a larger layer. It's, it's really compositionally set up very nice. The only thing that I might have considered, and maybe you did this and it didn't work out, 
is when you get this shot, because the guy's face is what you want, it's spectacular. Then move a couple steps to the left and see how it looks with the, with the guy on the bike in between them. And maybe he's too big, maybe it would block something out, and maybe you tried it. I'm, I'm anxious to hear if you did. My only suggestion for composition would be maybe move left and that'll, that'll push the guy on the bike into the middle of the table and see what it looks like. Your processing is tremendous. You've got all the, um, the smoothness. And before I recommended to somebody put a teeny tiny glow on it. And this actually has that look or that effect. It makes it creamier, but still detailed is what a glow will do. And you just put the smallest amount on that will make the image look how you want it to look. Um, it's really sharp, it's exposed well, it's a good shot, you use layers. Um, the only distraction I could find is something that was really there, but I would still take it out, is this little white mark behind him. I know it's there, but I don't want anything that's, it's kind of like a little repeat of his head. It's got the light on the top and darker on the bottom, just like his head. So I would take that out of there and uh, the focus will be completely on that face of his. The lighting is super. There's no facial shadows to distract anything. Uh, it's a great street shot. My only suggestion is to take that little white bother some spec out and see what you think. Everything else looks tremendous. Who did this? Oh, that's mine. Uh, Mike. Norbert, it's all about the face. <laughs> hey, uh, Mike, I can remember this well. Matter of fact, that was a much larger shot. I went and cropped that severely, you know, because I was using a prime 50 millimeter lens from the other side of the street. And uh, there was a lot more involved here. Uh, let me ask you a question. What do you think about that sidewalk? Do you think that should be toned down? It could be because it really doesn't have any play in the picture. Yeah, yeah. So yes, it could be toned down. And yeah. also, can you see my cursor, Norbert? Yes, I, yeah, I can see it. Move your crop in a little bit here, too. Okay. See this little sliver? Yeah, I do see that. All right, then you can get rid of that. That's not okay. helpful either. But yeah, you're right. Um, it's this is the shot that's right so i was looking for that guy <laughs> when i say befuddled he's 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 like he's a, he's a star of the show he really is yes and and in retrospect i wish i could have got the the, the plain folk guy more in the center between the two but it's street photography and it is exactly. what it is you know <laughs> exactly yeah so yeah try try pulling down the highlights just a bit on the sidewalk and crop this and get rid of this thing here, will you? Yeah, I see that now. I see that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. And okay. Norbert, look up a man named Bruce Gilden. Gilden? Gilden, G-I-L-D-E-N. Okay. He has a lot of street photography that has a face like this. Oh, man. He's not uh, very <laughs> um, complimentary to his subjects. So I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. Okay. Great shot. Right, did, thanks, you put any, did you put any glow on that? Yes, there is a little bit of glow on that. Matter of fact, I, matter fact, so. I, I did work on some of the tones, the black and the whites. And, uh, and I try to get kind of a, uh, you know, I try to bring out the grays and the, and the black and the white, and try to get the, you know, use all the tonal values, if you will. Yes, exactly. That's what a good yeah. black and white yeah. does. Yeah. And that's, that's whoever I mentioned to the tiny little, little um, glow before. That's yeah. the effect that it gives, a creamy but still detailed look. Okay. Okay, thanks for using thanks the glow, that helped me. Okay, supply chain. Photograph number eight. Uh, your composition, I, I like. It's asymmetrical as opposed to symmetrical, but the sides are not identical. So it doesn't have to be symmetrical. You're not used dealing in mirror images or anything like that, but it still uses a tremendous amount of linear perspective as you follow down to a vanishing point, which should be right in there somewhere. 
and also atmospheric perspective, meaning the things farthest away are lighter in tone or value or color. And that also creates depth. So you can see that there's a tremendous amount of depth in this image for sure. Um, some people don't like putting a texture on things. I really don't mind it because I think it's appropriate to hear. I don't think anybody would look at that and say, oh, that's a modern picture. They just put a texture on it. It looks old because the subject matter looks old. So I think here your, your, um, your texture is appropriate for sure. I, I like the look of it. And one other thing is um, you see the sky really has almost nothing in it. Well, that's actually appropriate to the photograph because the old wet plate collodion, which is what this is very reminiscent of, the wet plate collodion, the collodion, the chemicals, didn't react well with blue light. So in those old wet plate collodion shots, the sky is almost always white unless they did something to it. Some photographers would make like a double exposure and block out the sky and then block out the bottom and try and expose that way. So, so this is actually appropriate to the history. Uh, the wow factor is good. Your, your exposure is good. It's not super, super crisp, but the part of that's because of the texture and that's fine. Um, the old wet plates were super crisp, but not when they got old or not when they um, were moved or whatever. So I, I think it's appropriate there. Repeated shapes in your composition, for sure, it has a rhythm. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it looks good. I like what you did with the composition and I think the texture itself worked out. So who did this? Uh, this is Joe Farrow. I did this image. This was in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. And uh, there must have been maybe 20 of these docks where the ships were loading and unloading. And um, so I had lots of opportunities to take quite a few pictures of it. And I did. Uh, and I did exactly what you said is I put a texture layer on it, which I'm not real big on. And <laughs> I did that because I, it needed it. It was, it was old. It was truly an old pier with old equipment and with old ships. And uh, it just, when I looked at it without the texture layer, it looked too crisp. It just didn't seem right. So I put the texture layer on to uh -huh. give it that look. Good, very good. Do you have, um, does any of your, so oh, you have on one, don't you? I do, and that's what I use for that. I've <laughs> had a feeling. <laughs> one thing I might give a try and see what you think is, you know, there's like 85 million borders in there. Yeah. So maybe one of those old antique borders you might want to try. But I, I like the photograph as is, but maybe you want to try that and see what you get. That's a great idea, Mike. I, I didn't think of that. Uh, great idea, because that would that would do something to mask that brightness on the edges, but still keep it looking. That's great. I'm going to do that. All right, Joe, I suggest you look at a website by Christopher Aaron, E-R-I-N, Christopher Aaron. Okay. The website is called Higher Resolution Photography. All right. So take a look and see if his stuff is appropriate to what you're doing here. Okay, thanks. I really appreciate my Mike. You're for welcome. Doing okay, here we are at our last one, Photographer in the Mists. And that looks suspiciously to me like <laughs> Joe Farrell, actually. Um, Joe, don't take offense, but it reminded me of that really famous photograph of the Sasquatch. Well, thank you know you. how he's walking along through the woods? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the angle is tremendous. You tried something brand new. You went for a, you created a creepy kind of look. Um, the black and white is a real good choice here. I really do like that. And normally you would say, oh, the foreground is way out of focus. Well, that's kind of the point. That's why it's creepy. When you see like the monster movies, the bushes they're looking through are not in perfect sharp focus. 
So this is, when something's out of focus and you can tell it's on purpose, that's different than, than not being in focus, not on purpose. Now, I don't know if you purposely, I know the light was probably, it was early, obviously, because of the fog and the mist. Um, he's a little bit soft because your shutter speed was probably slow and he was moving. But in this case, that helps to say what you want to say. Now, back in the day, and I mean back in the day, they when it was filmed, they'd always said, expose for the highlights. Let the shadows fall where they may. And that actually holds true today as well. And in that case, I think you would have gained a little detail on the water. Although again, I'm looking, on a, looking at it on a computer screen, so that, that'll make a difference. If you want a little detail on the water, try your highlights or your whites in the slider and see what you think. If you're after that dreamy kind of spooky look, you got it. Um, as far as post-processing, if you want to straighten the um, horizon, do it. But if you're after like an off-kilter, scary kind of look, let it as is. But it's just, uh, it looks like it's falling a little bit downhill to the right. On the left spot, the left frame right here, I would clone that out. That's not... That's not really helpful. That's too much of an attention getter. And you want the attention here. So this I would clone away. And really you could afford to even darken this a little bit if you wanted, because this is where you want people to look, right in this triangulation and his whole body is triangulated. So that's, that's the main thing in the shot. Uh, let's see. Your black and white was a good choice. I already mentioned that. Uh, maybe a little bit less exposure. Try, try dropping your exposure a tiny bit or try sliding your contrast button up a little bit. Your framing is good. The pose is really good, really good. I really like that, the triangulation and the fact that he's looking to the side, trying to make a decision. It's a, it's a good story. It's a little bit creepy, but it's a very good story. It's a creative shot. And I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, 10 points off. That's not sharp. Something like this doesn't need to be sharp. It needs to be a little scary. And you did a good job there. Um, there's a French photographer named, uh, well, Elaine, I guess it's pronounced, Le Boyle. And I'm going to suggest... Um, whoever did this, you look at him, but I'll give you his name in a minute. Who did this shot? Uh, that's me, Mike, Rod Frazier. Rod, pretty cool. All right, thanks. I have to give credit to my model, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, model, thanks, don't Rod. do that. Don't do that. Models are finicky and they demand payment. <laughs> yeah, well, Mike, I was, I was going for something ethereal, so... Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I like the... Uh, that it, it, you couldn't quite, it wasn't as far as clear. Uh, I, I kind of liked the way it was. Uh, right. But yeah, I, I like the, maybe I could clone out that one section on the left to concentrate on the model in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And, Try it and see what you think. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I didn't mention any little white dots, did I? <laughs> is that good? <laughs> you see where my cursor is? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> anything that's as that's lighter than what's around it is going to show so keep an eye out for that um i do like your story i like your idea i like the fact that you didn't hesitate to break one of the laws of photography and have things out of focus so um it's a it's a pretty cool image for sure thanks mike you're welcome now, the photographer I want you to look at, he's a French photographer. He photographs his kids, and they must live in the middle of nowhere because they have what they call a swimming pool, but it's really like a hole dug in the ground, and they have cats everywhere, it, and his, he photographs these kids, and it's fabulous. It's, it's a lot like this, actually. His name is Alan, A-L-A-I-N, 
and his last name is probably pronounced Labois. It's L-A-B-O-I-L-E. Alan Labois, A-L-A-I-N-L-A-B-O-I-L-E. And you're, you'll, see, you'll see some connections with what you're doing here. Okay. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. And that is the end of that. Very good. Very good. Uh, anyone have any uh, questions for any of the uh, photographers or for Mike? I have a comment. Yes. I just want to say happy birthday, Dennis. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. <laughs> Thanks. Anything else? You must have yeah, read the you must have read the chat where Dennis put today's my birthday. <laughs> that was yesterday. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. One of the more I, important things. Anybody have anything for Mike or, or for any of the photographers? Mike. Yes. On the photograph where it was, um, I think it was one back where the people were, no, one more, where the people were sitting. Yeah. There was, there's something there between right next to the guy's shoulder and, and the windowsill. Do you see that? Am I, no, over, over, come over the other way. Come on, no more, right there, right on the windowsill. Can you, it's, it's not in the glass. It looks like there's something the laying on there. It's white. Oh, oh, right here. Yeah, right there. Well, Norbert's going to get rid of that. <laughs> get rid of it. <laughs> I didn't know if you saw that. I, I just, I saw it. I thought, Gee, what is it? I saw it originally, but then I didn't mention it later. You're getting too much like me. Yeah, also that, that same image, I, I can't help but keep looking at that sign that's beside his head. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and and uh, then my eye jumps over to the no smoking sign. Photography, this is what it's all about. <laughs> That's right. Okay, guys, other comments, uh, questions or comments for Mike, any of the other photographers? Really appreciate the, uh, the thorough review. Mike always gives good references too, and those are very helpful. Uh, absolutely. Good. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, guys, if you want to unmute yourself for a second here, uh, let's give Mike a nice round. Here's how you give him a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you very much okay guys let's wrap this up uh, i'll send out the follow-up email tomorrow with the link to the recording of course a reminder no meeting next monday night uh, so december the 6th will be our next uh, zoom meeting and i want to take this opportunity to wish everyone a very very happy thanksgiving yeah to you and yours okay thank, thank you yeah, it certainly is nice to be able to get together again with uh, friends and family. So great ber great. happy birthday, Dennis. Thank you. Had a very nice time. Very enjoyable. I spent uh, two hours photographing a Boy Scout uh, uh, ceremony. Uh, they were honoring eight scouts in Troop 190 Mechanicsburg who became Eagle Scouts. They earned their merit badges during the, the pandemic. And this was just a wonderful, wonderful occasion. Uh, each one of the Eagle Scouts got to talk a little bit and about their experiences and uh, it was really a neat, neat uh, day. And then we went out for dinner in the evening with the uh, family. So thanks, guys. Yes. Okay, take care. Okay. We'll see you next okay. time. Okay. Joe, I yeah. would never, I did, I would never have guessed that was your image. Really? That just okay. seems so atypical to what I usually see from you. That was right. interesting. Then did you not, think about that whenever you submitted it? Uh, actually, I thought of supply chain because that's the hot thing right now. Right. And that was the, the why I chose it. But I had processed that actually about five years ago. And uh, wow. uh, and I actually, that was exactly what I did five years ago with that uh, texture layer on it. So that was very unusual for me. You're right. 
Yeah, interesting. Was there a white vignette on that too? No, that was the nature of the, that's why when he mentioned the, uh, the border, I think that would really help. That would just bring your, it would bring it in. Yeah. Well, it spurred me to make a note for myself to, to get back on, uh, on one. I haven't used it for a long time, but the thing I, I liked about it years ago when I first got it were the borders. Yeah. That's, that's why I, I downloaded and installed it. So I want to get back to that. And they have that little glamour glow built into it also. Yes. So like, yes. I want to use that again. And then the textures. I don't have any textures other than what's in uh, on one. <laughs> Oh, okay. I've, I've been saving texture layers for years and I've got a whole library of, of different ones, all kinds yeah. of stuff. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to go out tomorrow um, sometime during the day and check out some of the historic sites for the, mm. the West Shore Historical Society. Yeah. Uh, and that, I, that, was, that was instructive for me today. I took pictures of each one. I was just working on that this evening oh. uh, with each, uh, each location and which ones I think are good or bad. And said, we got a couple here. All we need is like three for a trip, but then uh, some guidance for the folks that are gonna go out on their own. And uh, there's some you can do well on your own, but it wouldn't be good for a trip. Right, so. oh, good. Yeah, I have a church on my list, so I think that might be good. But the other ones, I think, from what I can yeah. tell so far, just don't look like much. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Take care. Okay, good night. Okay, take care. See you, Dimitri. Bye now.